Hello, I'm Senator Melanie Griffith, and I'm here with the team uh, from Annapolis, uh, Letitia Beal, who is the Chief of Staff, Karen White, who's the Special Assistant, and Najee Bailey, who is the Legislative Aide, and Sherma Brousseau, who is our Community Liaison, and actually uh, led our last presentation on healthy eating on a budget. So if you haven't seen it, just visit our YouTube channel. We'll give you, uh, put in the chat room how you can find us on YouTube, and you definitely wanna, wanna hear those uh, information. And we actually had a recipe cooked during our last Let's, let's Talk. Our first presenter this evening is Deborah C. McBroom, who's worked with Prince George's County's Department of Family Services for over 29 years. She spent 24 of those years with the Aging Disability Service Division. And in addition, she's worked as coordinator for the Senior Information and Assistance Program and the Family Caregivers Program. Ms. McBroom currently serves as the unit manager for the Prince George's County Aging and Disabilities Resource Unit, where she manages several programs to include state health insurance program, the family caregiving program, the senior information and assistance program, and disability resource services. Ms. McBroom's previous work history includes a medical discharge planner and a family preservation counselor. She has a bachelor's degree in social work and a master of public health administration. Uh, give her a round of applause. Yay, virtual applause. All right, our second presenter is Ms. Shalise Thomas who is a lifelong resident of Prince George's County. She attended Oxon Hill High School before graduating from Frostburg State University with a bachelor's in psychology and our, uh, okay, let me see, Argosy, wait, and Argosy University, I don't know, I may have an uh, error on my script, I apologize. She has a master's in community counseling uh, Ms. Thomas used her skill set in a variety of settings, including healthcare consulting, disability assessments, assistive technology accommodations, and community integration for the intellectually disabled and mentally ill communities. While at the Department of Family Services, Ms. Thomas has been able to assist members of the community with Medicare counseling. She provides hospital to home support and options counseling. As you can hear from these introductions, we have two incredible <laughs> presenters. We're very fortunate to have them. Give Ms. Thomas a round of applause. All right, so we're ready to talk about caregiving and long-term care resources and, and enrollment. Ms. McBroom, you have the Zoom room. All right. Well, thank you very much, Senator Griffith, for that introduction. And I also want to thank you and your staff for putting together this workshop. Uh, this is something that <clears throat> I have uh, talked about um, throughout my years as uh, an employee with the Prince George's County Department of Family Services, Aging and Disabilities Services Division. So I know that this is a topic that a lot of people um, may have an interest in even if they're um even if they're not on the call uh because a lot of people i find don't necessarily even identify themselves as the caregiver so to kind of begin this the presentation the first slide um <clears throat> that we have after the topic is the topic is taking care of your long-term care resources to be proactive so the next slide um Next couple of slides, I, am, I wanna try to help people identify themselves as a caregiver. So I wanted to start off with get, giving you some data. So <clears throat> um, caregiving among African-American adults and who are caregivers? So there's 60% of caregivers are women. 14% are 65 and older. 3% of caregivers are caring for a parent or a parent-in-law. 9% of caregivers are providing care to someone with dementia. 80% of caregivers are helping with household tasks. So they may be helping with cooking, uh, laundry, housekeeping, 
And then over 50% are also providing assistance with personal care, dressing, bathing, feeding, and caregiving can be um, lengthy. So nearly half have provided care for at least two years. And one third have provided care for at least 20 hours per week. And what's interesting is that those caregivers that are 65 and older are oftentimes caring for someone that's older than them. And that caregiver that's 65 and older, more often than not, can have some chronic illnesses of their own. The next slide, please. So throughout my work um, with the um, Aging and Disabilities Services Division, I had an opportunity to work with many, many caregivers. So I came up with a way of identifying different types of caregivers. Uh, and it's fun when I talk about this because I can see in the audience, not virtually, but when I'm, I'm speaking face to face, I can kind of see by people's reaction what type of caregiver they are. So one of the types of caregivers is the working caregiver. That's the caregiver who probably works an eight hour day job. They leave their job and they may go home and provide some caregiving duties, or in some cases, they may provide some caregiving duties before they even leave to go to work. And then there's the targeted caregiver. The targeted caregiver is the caregiver that may be responsible for a very specific task for the person that, re that requires care or the care recipient. So oftentimes you might have the targeted caregiver when you have a lot of family uh, support involved. So if there's several family members that are involved in the caregiving, you might have one um, family member, her targeted responsibility may be to prepare meals. Another family member may be responsible for taking the um, care recipient back and forth to doctor's appointments. Uh, another care recipient may be responsible for handling all the finances. So those are the targeted caregivers. And these caregiving roles can overlap. You can have more than one role. And then there's the crisis caregiver. This is a person that um, did not identify as a caregiver. They will probably, if, they, if it were a parent, the parent may have been independent, living on their own, and then a crisis occurred then all of a sudden this family member had to take on this responsibility out of nowhere. Um, the isolated caregiver, that's the caregiver who is not connected. They're not connected to the community. They're not connected to family. Um, they're not necessarily connected to any particular faith community. Um, I, was, I tell this story all the time. I was in a, a grocery store several years ago and um, I'm just kind of puddling along. And this lady was standing in line to purchase her items and all of a sudden she fainted. So several people ran over to her. And once she came to, she talked about how she had run to the grocery store and she was racing to get back home because her husband had just gotten out of the hospital and she had to pick up some items for him. Um, and I guess she had just, you know, in, in her effort to provide the highest level of care to him, she clearly was not taking care of herself. So we asked her, is there someone that can come and pick you up from the store? She said, no, she had no one that could come pick her up from the store. She had no one who we could call to let them know what was going on. So that's an example of an isolated caregiver. She's the sole person responsible for this person and there's nobody looking out for either one of them except her. And then there's the who's the caregiver. Who's the caregiver is when I walk into a home and I see two frail elderly people living alone and I can't figure out who's the caregiver and who's the care recipient. It's almost like they're both in need of care, but they're struggling trying to provide whatever care they can for each other. Um, and then there's the nobody can do it better caregiver. That's the caregiver that may have people around, may have family members that may offer to help. Um, and over a period of time, they may stop offering to help because the nobody can do a better caregiver 
feels like I'm not going to ask someone to do something because they're not going to do it as good as I can. Uh, and then there's the neglectful caregiver. The neglectful caregiver is the caregiver who may be intentional, but sometimes most of the time is not intentional. They're, pro they're providing the best care that they can provide, but it's just not enough to maintain a safe level of care for the care recipient. Next slide. So the next slide is um, caregiver's support team. So this is in the caregiver resource guide that um, Senator Griffith's office sent the link to. Um, when, when you're in the mix of a, uh, being a caregiver, it might be helpful to have a support team. And then who should be on that support team? So it can include a mixture of people. So the people on that support team, it could be um, friends, family, clergy, the faith community. Um, it could be uh, the primary care physician. It could be the nurse, medical specialist, the therapist, the caseworker, options counselor, social worker. Um, it could be the attorney, accountant, or financial planner. Now for the caregiver support team, which is more your people that are in your inner circle, the faith friends and things like that, they can provide assistance with care for your loved one. They can provide emotional, spiritual support and even some mental health support to you. Um, the health professional, um, professionals, which would be the nurses, the doctors, the therapists, caseworkers, they can um, help you with maintaining the mental and physical health of your loved one as well. Um, they can diagnose medical problems, administer medications and treatment. And then the legal and financial, that's the attorney and accountant. These are the individuals that can help you with that financial planning um, and aid with you with um, doing estate planning, end of life directives, tax help, and just planning for the overall long-term care, um, the legal aspects of long-term care. Um, the warning signs, these are the signs that let you know help may be needed. So if you have a family member, um, you want to check to see if the recipient um, has been um, um, paying their bills on a monthly basis. Sometimes um, you, when you become aware that there's a problem, it may be after the gas has been turned off, the water has been turned off, the electricity has been turned off, um, they're behind in their rent or mortgage or their credit cards have been, have, have been not been paid. And sometimes it's not because they don't have the money, it's just because they don't have the wherewithal to remember to, to um, pay these bills. And uh, check to see if the recipient has made large purchases. I've seen some cases where I had an elderly woman, she was probably in her mid seventies. Um, uh, she had come to our office, she had driven to our office, but I had gone past her house too. So I know she was a, a hoarder. Her personal hygiene was very poor yet, and her mobility wasn't that great either, but this woman was driving a Z28 sports car. And that was a little odd that a woman in her age category um, and with her health conditions would have chosen that particular vehicle. Um, sometimes they may be talked into um, purchasing appliances and things that they don't need. And another telltale sign is sometimes they can be vulnerable to scams. They, if, if someone comes to the door and offers to put, on, put in new windows or cabinets or new roof and by the time you find out, you know, it might be the case that they have been charged an exorbitant amount of money for the work that was done and the quality of the work may not have been sufficient. And check to see if there are any changes in home and self-care. So if your loved one was once very meticulous, very neat, well-groomed, kept their home immaculate, um, and then all of a sudden over a period of time when you see that person, the home is not maintained as well as it used to be, uh, and the personal hygiene 
Um, they, they're wearing um, the same clothes every day. The clothes may have um, um, food stains and dirty stains on the clothing, and they may have lost substantial amount of weight. There may be other things going on, but that's definitely a clue that uh, you might want to maybe have a doctor involved to, to do an assessment and um, determine if they do need a higher level of care. Next slide, please. Long-term care programs. Some of the programs that we offer in the Area Agency on Aging, we have uh, the Ombudsman Program, and that particular program is a program that says promotes the highest quality of life and care possible for residents in long-term care facilities. The Ombudsman Program, with the assistance of volunteers, investigates and seeks resolutions to problems which affect residents' rights, healthcare, safety, and welfare. So that's a good point of contact. If you have a, a, a family member that's in a long-term care facility or in an assisted living facility, sometimes issues come up and families feel overwhelmed and they feel like they're not getting any resolution with working with the facility, they can always contact our ombudsman. So the guardianship program, uh, let me just talk a little bit about guardianship in general. So guardianship is uh, appointed through the court system. The court will appoint a guardian of property and a guardian of person. <clears throat> and usually if the family, if the person who petitions the court for guardianship is not necessarily appointed the guardian, the uh, court will determine based on the evidence and to determine if the, one of the criteria to determine if the person needs guardian is that they have to have a um, petition by uh, cert certification by two doctors or social worker to say that the person is not capable of making decisions on their own behalf. Now with our guardianship program, it says public guardianship program, but it's not accessible by the public. <clears throat> In order to access the guardianship program, the person would have gone through the court and the court would have appointed our office to act as guardian for someone that's 65 and over the guardian of person. If the person is under 65, then the Department of Social Services will be appointed to be the guardian of person. And if necessary, the court can also appoint someone to be the guardian of property or finances. Uh, I tell family members, if you petition the court, the court is going to request that all interested parties also participate in that hearing. So, you know, if the if the daughter petitions the court, the court will um, um, have all interested parties. It could be other siblings. It could be sisters, brothers. Um, it could be a neighbor. Um, and I've seen cases where if the if the ch adult children are in court and they are not on one accord, they're arguing and fussing amongst each other, the court will say, you know what? I'm not gonna appoint any of you all to be guardian. I will appoint the Department of Social Services or Family Services to be guardian of person. Uh, so that's, and there's no income or asset limit for the guardianship program, it's just, uh, a legal process that will appoint someone to be the person's guardian if they cannot make decisions on their own behalf. Next slide, please. Um, some of the programs, the long-term care programs that we offer include, uh, we have the Community First Choice Program and the Community Personal, Community Personal Assistance Services. Both of these programs are Medicaid long-term care programs, home and community-based programs. In order to be eligible for the program, you must have community medical assistance, which is the lowest income eligible medical assistance. There are about 20, 25 different types of medical assistance programs. The lowest income is this particular one um, um, requires. And the income for that is typically the, the supplemental security income or SSI amount of $795. And the asset limit is $2,000. But both of these programs will provide in-home care assistance with incontinence supplies. Um, they may provide some case management, um, um, nursing assessments. Uh, so, and, and the other 
other good thing about it is that they typically don't have a waiting list like some of the other programs that, that are offered. Next slide, please. Uh, the Home and Community-Based Options Waiver Program <coughs> is also a Medicaid program, but they have a higher income limit. The income limit for this particular program, and they only look at the individual's income, not the couple. But the income limit is $2,349, and the asset limit is about $2,500 for the individual. This particular program is they can provide assistance in the home or an assisted living facility. And the, um, they can provide up to eight hours a day, seven days a week of in-home care. They can help with the purchase of incontinence supplies. So I call this like the Cadillac of home care services that are offered in the state. This is probably the most inclusive home care program that we offer. Next slide, please. Um, the senior care program, <clears throat> is a, a program is kind of like a gap filling program for people that are age 65 and older where they can provide about six hours a week uh, and it's typically about two or three days a week two hours each day of home care service they can help with um, personal care and chores <clears throat> and then there's a the senior assisted living subsidy program which offers assistance with the cost of purchase of uh, uh, the cost of an assisted living facility so the maximum amount that they can offer, I think is about $600. They were talking about taking the subsidy up to about $1,000 per month towards the cost of maintaining someone in an assisted living facility. The income limits and the asset limits for the programs are the same. So the income limit for the senior care and the assisted living subsidy program um, for an individual is about 3,000 a month. For a couple, it's close to 4,000. And the asset limit for the individual is $19,000 per year and $25,000 for the couple for the senior care and the senior assisted living subsidy program. Now with the, uh, a senior assisted living subsidy program, we have a contract with about 80 different assisted living facilities in Prince George's County. And in Prince George's County, we have about 240 or more assisted living facilities. In order to be a contract, to have a contract with us um, to provide the subsidy, um, the assisted living facility, it's, it's the smaller facilities, the mom and pop assisted living facilities that house typically maybe about six to eight residents. Uh, the larger assisted living facilities in the county are probably over about $4,000 a month. The smaller assisted living facilities run probably around $3,000 or more per month. Next slide, please. Adult daycare is another option for family members that are seeking support um, with caring for their loved one. So the uh, adult daycare facilities typically provide um, assistance during the work hours. They offer transportation to and from their facilities. They are usually operating during the work hours. So if someone is working, they can drop off or they can have their family member picked up. Um, they go to the facility where they provide snacks and a meal um, as well as supervised activities. And then in the evening, hopefully towards the end of your work day, then um, they can be picked up or dropped off to your home. The cost of adult daycare is probably $85, $90 or so per day, but community medical assistance also pays for adult daycare. Next slide, please. Uh, respite care uh, provides assistance <clears throat> when the caregiver is not going to be available. So they can, it can provide that short-term relief. So for example, if the caregiver has a medical procedure that needs to be done and they're not gonna be available, then the um, respite care um, can have someone come in and provide that care while you're not available either in a home or an assisted living facility. And sometimes it could be even provided in a nursing home. It's very short term, however, um, if the caregiver just needs a break and wants to take a vacation, um, you can utilize some of the respite care programs that are available in the county. Next slide. We have the telephone reassurance program. This is a program where we have volunteers that will call uh, clients 
on a daily basis or maybe once or twice a week just to check in with them and see how they're doing. This is good for those people that may be more isolated. There is no income or asset limit for this program either. Next slide. Um, private pay options for long-term care. Next slide. Uh, sometimes, um, <clears throat> anytime you're dealing with government resources, federal, state, local, and you're trying to access services, there are going to be guidelines. There are going to be income limits. There may be asset limits. There may be age limits. Uh, there may be regional limits. The program may be set up for people that live in a certain zip code. Uh, and, and, and not everybody is going to meet the guidelines to be eligible for those programs. And inevitably, there may also be waiting lists. So sometimes you might have to privately pay for long-term care. Some people might have long-term care insurance to cover the cost of um, those types of um, the personal care that the person may need assistance with. The one thing though, if you could go back, yeah, one thing is that there may be pre-existing conditions. If you have pre-existing conditions, either you might not be insurable for long-term care insurance, or you might have to pay a higher premium, a cost for that insurance. And co the coverage may be limited, maybe time limited, depending on uh, how much you're able to pay or willing to pay. So you can have long-term care insurance that will cover for two years, three years, five years, or you might have um, long-term care insurance that will cover you indefinitely. And of course, there are various other um, plan options. Uh, some plans may offer a flat daily rate. They may say, we'll give you $300 or $400 a day for long-term care. Others may say, we'll pay for so much for in-home care, so much for assisted living, so much for nursing homes. So if you're considering long-term care insurance or if you've already purchased it, um, particularly if you've already purchased it, please read through that policy very thoroughly so you are familiar with what the guidelines are um, to access that benefit. Uh, another way that you can finance your long-term care insurance, I'm not advocating one way or the other, but um, you can use a reverse mortgage. Now, I will say that I have run into a lot of people that have a reverse mortgage and oftentimes they are still seeking financial assistance, which tells me that they may that getting that reverse mortgage may not have been the best decision for them. But I have seen a few cases where people have utilized the reverse mortgage um, very effectively. But to get the reverse mortgage, you have to be 62 and older. And it allows, allows the homeowner <clears throat> to use the equity that they have in their home. So if you have a home that's valued at $300,000, if you get the reverse mortgage, they're not gonna give you all of the equity. They may give you $200,000 worth of the $300,000 equity that you have if the home is paid off. And then with that $200,000, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do with it. And I have had people that did whatever they want, wanted to do with it um, for example, um, I had a lady that bought a car, uh, people who have given the money to family members. I had a 74-year-old lady who got a reverse mortgage and got a facelift. However, you can also take that reverse mortgage money to finance your long-term care, to pay for the, in, uh, the aid service uh, and the other um, things that you might need to, to provide for your care. You must remain in the home, however, if you get that reverse mortgage. And once you're no longer in that home for one year, then you either have to sell the property or start paying that reverse mortgage back, the amount that you borrowed. And the interest rates can be much higher than the standard interest rate for mortgage. And with that, you have to do an assessment to say, you know, sometimes it might be better if you cannot maintain yourself in the home to sell the property and downsize to something that will be more manageable. So then you'll get the full um, benefit of the equity. Next slide, please. Uh, 
if you are looking for <clears throat> in-home care and you're having to privately pay, but even if you are um, getting it through one of the government agencies that I covered earlier, um, you want to know how available is that um, individual or that agency, how, uh, what's the availability of them physically getting someone to come into the home? Uh, is it, uh, do they have someone available in the area that you live? And then you have skilled care versus personal care. Do you need someone to come in and um, 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 administer a feeding tube or IVs or things like that? That skilled care is going to be more expensive than the personal care for someone to come in and help with dressing and bathing. Do they have to manage the medications? Those things determine um, you know, how expensive it can be. The hourly rates. What's the hourly rate for uh, an aid in this market because of COVID, the hourly rate may be as high as 25 to 27, $30 an hour. And then what duties do you want them to perform? Uh, family members will say, well, I have paid someone to come in and they just sat there all day and didn't do anything. Well, that may indicate that you didn't give them anything to do. So you might want to be very specific when you coordinate with that individual or that agency what the duties are. Uh, I want you to do laundry. When you come in on Mondays, I want you to prepare meals. I want you to go to the grocery store, be very specific. And even if you want the person to sit and watch TV and talk with your mother or father or family member, that needs to be very specific down to those type of tasks as well. And then compatibility. You want to make sure that the person that's coming in your home is going to be compatible and a good match with your family member. I have seen situations where that, you know, that part of that of the hiring wasn't really discussed. I had a, a it's difficult to talk about, but I had a, a, a elderly couple that were German and, and they were in their 80s. I mean, they were in their 90s, actually, and they had <clears throat> gone through an agency and the agency sent a very young African-American female. And it was very problematic um, because of the elderly gentleman, German gentleman's background and this young lady. And that was, it was not very compatible at all. Also had a case where I had a 90 something year old elderly female <clears throat> who had, uh, she was African-American female and she got an aid through one of the home care government funded services. And the person had a very, very heavy accent and the 90 some year old was extremely hard of hearing. So it was very difficult and frustrating for the elderly woman to be able to communicate what her needs were with this individual. So those are the type of conversations you wanna have with the agency or the individual. If you're Family members very quiet. You don't want someone that's going to be in there talking a mile a minute all day. That might be annoying to them. Next slide, please. Um, home modification programs. There are a couple of programs. There's the Accessible Homes for Seniors. This is an excellent program that can help senior citizens who need to make some modifications to make their homes more accessible. If they need uh, railings, ramps, if they need their doorway widened, if they need their bathroom modified to accommodate a wheelchair or walker. This program is for people age 55 and older. <clears throat> the income limits, um, can the income can be as high as 61,000 for individual and 70,000 for a couple. There is no asset limit. And this particular program, they will put a lien on the property, but um, there is no expectation that you have to pay the money back unless the property is sold or transferred to someone else. And sometimes family members, not the individual, ha have a problem with that. So if you get the Accessible Homes Program and then there's a housing rehab program and your house is valued again at $300,000, you have the modifications done, it could increase the value of your property so that your family member, if you transition out of the home or the house transfers to them, they can get a house that's valued now at 330,000 and all they may have to pay back is a $30,000 loan, but it has allowed your family member or that care recipient to maintain their independence in their home for a little bit longer. Next slide, please. 
Um, the housing rehab program is, is similar to the accessible homes program. Um, they can do the modifications as well, but they can also help you with putting a new roof on, new windows, um, new driveway, um, because the, the goal is to help the individual to maintain property standards. Uh, so if you need to have your kitchen redone or your bathroom redone, they may not necessarily give you the uh, uh, quartz or, or, or granite and stainless steel, but they will um, bring it up to a certain standard, um, given the fact that your home may not have been updated in the last 40 or 50 years. Um, they can help you with those plumbing and electrical type of issues as well. The income and asset limits are the same. You can move advance the slide. Um, and then there's the technology. <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we can do to assist with maintaining our loved ones in their homes and, and their independence. So for example, if the individual is having difficulty managing their medications, there are medication dispensers out there where you can program and put all the medications in. And when it's time for that person to take their medication, an alarm will go off to let them know. And if they don't take the medication at that time, it will remind them. And then eventually it'll lock them out and notify a family member that they haven't taken the medications uh, so that they won't over medicate. There are, um, there's technology where you can put sensors in the home so that if a family member is sitting in a chair for five or six hours, that will be an alarm to let you know that there may be a problem um, with that individual. If they are, um, if you have an individual who are in the home and um, they're in the bathroom for a long period of time, the bathrooms are oftentimes a, a pretty risky place um, because of the potential that they may hit their heads and things like that. They can make you aware that that person has gotten up at two o'clock in the morning and they've been in that bathroom for a period of time. So definitely give our office a call or <clears throat> so that we can have the conversation and refer you to some agencies that can assist with that level of technology that may be able to help out. And some of it is very high end technology and some of, the, some of it may be very low end, just putting um, a little sensor um, by your door so that if the person with dementia gets close to the door, an alarm will go off. That's something that may be $10, $10 versus a peel dispenser that could be $60 per month to have that technology installed. Uh, next slide. Questions and answers. Anybody have any questions? Hello, um, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. And I know during the presentation, I had a question about the income limit versus the asset limit. Yep. So what does that mean? I think I may know, but I wanna hear. Uh, that's an excellent question. So the income limit is what you earn every month. So if you get a social security check, if you get a payroll check, all of that is income. Once you take that income and you put it in the bank, now it's an asset. Oh. Now the assets, if you're over the asset limit, you can spend it down to whatever the, 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 the qualifying mark is. The income limit, it's not a lot you can do with that. You can't tell social security to take $1,000. <laughs> Um, and, and I've had a case um, where we had an individual that we were trying to see if she would be eligible for a particular program that had an income limit. Mm -hmm. She told us her income. So we said, well, yeah, you're definitely within the income limit. So we went through the application process and she, as a part of the application, had to provide bank statements. So we looked at right. the bank statement. And we saw that there was another amount of money that she was getting every month. So we asked her about it and she said, well, you know, no, 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 that's not my income. That's my husband's income. So we said, well, you told us your husband is deceased. So she said, well, he is deceased, but that's his income I get from him every month. Doesn't work like that. What about saving? That's her, that's her income. She gets his yeah. security benefit, but right. that's her income. So um, what if you... 
what if you have the, um, you say once it hits your bank account, because suppose you have like a savings, like $50,000. That's an or... asset. That, and you know what else is an asset? If you have a life insurance policy that has a cash value, so okay. if you have a whole life insurance policy and you can turn it in and get cash from it, that's an asset. Now, typically the house that you live in is not considered an asset. The car that you drive may not be considered an asset. But if you own property that you don't live in, that's an asset. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Those were great questions. And I believe uh, Letitia has been monitoring the chat room and Ms. McBroom has a few additional questions for you. Um, yes. If you know someone who is a caregiver who may not have a support network, what steps should they take to put a team together? That's a good question. Um, you know, each case is so different. Some people think that because they don't have any children that they don't have a support network. They may have a neighbor that picks up the phone and calls and says, Miss A, I'm getting ready to go to the grocery store. You want me to grab something for you? That could be a, that's a caregiver. That's someone that's looking out for you. Um, if they're involved in their church, they, have, may, they may have someone in their church family um, that is interested and involved in their life. So it, it varies how you put that team together, but I would encourage them to give our, call, our office a call and that would be a part of our um, options counseling. Okay, so, so when somebody calls your office, is it more like a consultation? They're telling you what they need and then you just kind of go through something similar to the presentation and provide the, the options that they have? Right, so I typically would like, I like them to tell me their story and then I want them to tell me what they want. What, what is it that you want? So um, if they tell me they are 80 something years old, they live in their home, they wanna stay in their home, they don't have a lot of support system. Now I might be thinking that, I don't know how you're gonna um, maintain yourself in the home um, and they may not realize um, cause when I start asking questions, how do you do your laundry? Um, what's your mobility like? Do you have difficulty with mobility? When I start putting a picture together, then I'm going to kind of base my presentation based on their specific needs. I always tell the staff, this is not work where you could do cookie cutter, where everybody gets the same goodie bag. You have to be good listeners and listen to that individual and sometimes be willing to challenge and push a little bit. I might even say, so what is your plan when you can no longer maintain yourself in your home so that they can start telling you what it is that they want at that point? Because it's not our job to tell them what to do and how to do it. Okay, thank you. We can talk with them about the resources and the services that are available so that they can make informed choices. Are there uh, any low or no cost support services for the caregiver? Yes. Um, so like I said, respite care is the first thing that comes to mind that supports the caregiver. Um, we just recently um, received some um, funding to assist caregivers um, focusing on dementia. Um, so there are resources out there depending on what type of support that that caregiver may need. If, if it's financial, we have our caregiver grant that can support the caregiver. Um, if they need support what groups counseling, we can make recommendations and referrals for that as well. Okay, yeah, I think you answered this kind of, um, but I'm gonna ask anyway, are there steps someone should take in advance so they don't need a, oh, I'm sorry, this is different, uh, need a guardianship? Um, there are steps you can take by maybe doing a power of attorney, um, appointing someone in your family to, um, um, and that power of attorney can, you can have a power of attorney for health care to help you make health care decisions, and you can have a power of attorney for financial decisions. It could be the same person. It could be a different person. Um, sometimes people might feel obligated because they have to appoint the oldest child, but if the oldest child is not good with the money, then you don't want them to be the financial power of attorney. If the youngest person <laughs> Is, is is not good at taking care of themselves, you're still taking care of them, 
they may not be the, the appropriate person to be the one to make the healthcare decisions. So you have to think about it. It may not be none of any of your children. It might be your younger sibling that might be the better person to be the power of attorney. It could be your best friend. So those are hard choices, but these are things that we have to think about um, when we're making uh, decisions about power of attorney. And then find out what is the law um, within the state that you live. I would not recommend that you go online and download a document off the internet. You might want to talk to a, a, a financial person or a, a legal person when you're considering doing a power of attorney. It's not necessary, um, but it might be helpful. And then the living will and things like that, just so you have a, a understanding of what the laws are in Maryland so that you can protect yourself as best you can. Is there, are there, do you have a repository of attorneys who can help people or you just recommend that they look on their own? Well, we can't give you any direct referrals, but um, we do in our care, in our um, senior resource guide that um, um, we sent the link to. In that resource guide, there are lists of attorneys, financial, all kinds of resources. That um, that um, senior resource guide uh, is specifically a list of vendors that serve older adults and the disabled population, and okay. also has a list of the services and programs that we offer as well as the health department and social services. So that would be a good start. And then you can always go to the Maryland Bar Association as well. Um, and you can put in the category, if you want an attorney to talk about elder law, um, an attorney to talk about anything, um, you give them the topic and they'll come up with a list of attorneys that specialize in that particular area. Okay. How can you seek help for a neighbor if you notice a severe decline in their health? Um, if you think that that's a situation of uh, self-neglect, you can give our office a call. You can call Adult Protective Services. We've even had situations where people have, um, you know, we've had to um, call um, non-emergency police to do a wellness check. And oftentimes that was initiated because a neighbor called with concerns. Someone asked, um... They want to know if they heard that nursing homes and assisted living qualifications are the same. Now, I, I'm not an expert when it comes to um, when you're talking about the licensing of nursing homes and assisted living facilities. They all go by Comar um, guidelines and regulations, but I'm not sure what the specifics are for nursing homes versus assisted living. I'm sorry, that, that was my question. I asked because I have a friend who was just... <laughs> Uh, approved for a nursing home, but she's waiting for another approval to go into assisted living. So I was, I thought that they were the same. I'm, I'm thinking so, the one yeah. approval would, would not do for both then. Well, it all depends on how they're paying. If they're privately paying, I mean, yeah. I have to go through a lot of approval. If you, if you pay and you want assisted living, you get it. There's no oversight per se. Same, um, if you're going through a government agency to fund it, then they have to make sure that it's the least restrictive environment to match the level of care that the person needs. So okay. if person, um, wants to go into say an assisted living facility, um, then they have to have a level of care that says that they meet that guideline. Or if they have a assisted living level of care, then they may not be appropriate for a nursing home. You don't wanna put people who need that level of supervision and put them in a nursing home if it's not necessary. Yeah, she's in a nursing home. She, she's currently approved because she could not go back home. So she was mm -hmm. approved, in, you know, institutional Medicaid for nursing home, but she wants assisted living. And she was told that she has to do some other qualification. Yeah, there are there wanted. is yeah there are some other programs out there that medic that Medicaid waiver program will pay for home care and assisted living. So okay. meet the criteria for the nursing home level of care, then she could very well um, be eligible for um, care in an assisted living facility. Okay. Some other factors as well. Okay, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks for those. We have two more questions, Letitia, that we'll okay. take, and then we want to certainly give Miss Thomas an opportunity to um, share her information. So, if you want to do just two more, and then we'll we'll switch. Yeah. Um, the the last question. I mean, the one response I can give Miss McBroom is going to provide her contact information at the end. We're also going to send it out in a wrap up uh, summary to everyone who's registered. So that answers one question. The last question is, are there resources available for family members to be paid to care for their family member? Yes. Most of the home care programs that I talked about offer um, that as an option for the care recipient to decide who they want to provide their care. So, you know, back in the day, um, that didn't happen. You know, you, you call the government, the government told you this is what you're eligible for. Um, we're going to put an aid in your home. They're going to come out on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at nine o'clock in the morning and take it or leave it. Well, now we're moving more towards this person-centered model. So based on that, the consumer the will then be able to, to determine not only who will provide their care. Now, typically they will not let a pay a spouse to take care of a spouse, but if it's a, a daughter, son, sibling, anybody else can be um, a paid provider. But um, if, um, so, so yeah, they will allow um, that person to not only be select the provider, but you can also select what agency, what agency is gonna provide your, um, your um, medical equipment and in some cases to the extreme, you can also um, um, hire and fire these agencies. So it depends on how person-centered the, um, the, the agency that's providing the funds is. But yes, you can do that in both cases. But that's if you qualify based on the criteria that you laid out, correct? Correct. Thanks. Yeah, so you have to, uh, sometimes people think that because they have someone that can provide the home care or the aid service, that they should be able to get the service right away. It doesn't work that way. You first have to get the funding from the grantor and then um, there's the funds available to pay the aid. Excellent, excellent. Well, that was a lot of valuable information and um, we certainly wanna thank you and applaud you for that and um, for the resource information that you sent out which we'll resend with our summary of this presentation. We're excited now to turn the, the meeting over to Shalise Thomas, who has some additional information she'll share. Ms. Thomas, you now have the Zoom room. Okay. All right, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so when it comes to healthcare, it's important to recognize that there are various types of healthcare, just like there are various types of insurance benefits. Um, depending on the type of care that's needed, a lot of it has to do with the type of treatment or services that are going to be needed. So we have um, acute care, which are short term services. This is typically a severe condition, something where you're going to the hospital, you're receiving immediate attention. Um, but a lot of times it's going to be sh very short term. Um, there's also skilled care, which deals more with rehabilitative services. So this falls under things like your physical therapy, you're having to go to rehab. Can, thank you. You're having to go to rehab um, <clears throat> where services are going to be provided by a licensed professional. Um, there's also chronic care. This is more long term pre existing. Uh, where you've had these particular conditions for a lengthy period of time, um, like chronic back pain, leg things, you know, things that are going on that we've been dealing with for a significant period of time. And then there's also ambulatory, ambulatory care and outpatient care. Typically, you're not going to be admitted anywhere. This is kind of your in and out. Um, you're getting your diagnosis, you're being observed, treated, and sent home. Um, so depending on the type of care, um, that actually impacts funding um, to cover those particular services because all healthcare is not equal. Um, some healthcare benefits primarily focus on the acute skilled care where others handle more of the chronic long-term care. So depending on the particular type of healthcare that's needed, 
um, that's really going to be important to know what your insurance benefits cover. Um, next slide. Uh, along the lines of healthcare, uh, one of the additional programs that is actually a free program that is offered through the county uh, is our senior nutrition program. And this is an initiative that assists older, older adults with nutritional sound meals, um, congregate meals, um, because one of the things that's being uh, recognized is the fact that older adults in some cases tend to isolate. Um, so they're not really engaging anymore with their community. They may not be um, eating sound meals or eating enough meals. They may not have sufficient funds for meals. Um, that's overall going to impact your health. Um, so this is one of the free type of programs that are going to be available in the community um, that you can use to address that particular need. So as Ms. McBroom said, the different types of caregivers where one has a particular role, maybe one family member's their job is to make sure mom or dad gets set up with the senior nutrition program. So that way they can go ahead and make sure we know they've got meals, they're engaging in the community. So they're not you know, experiencing or developing or worsening you know, depression or other kind of mental health things. We're trying to balance out the mental and the physical um, health care. Next slide. Uh, an additional program uh, that also goes into monitoring our health care, taking care of oneself, there is a chronic disease self-management and health program. Um, this is a series of courses that individuals can sign up for um, <clears throat> through Prince George's County community where they can focus on uh, living well techniques. So when you have chronic diseases, it teaches you self-management techniques, for example, with diabetes. Um, diabetes, oftentimes it, it's, it's, it's a daily, um, daily condition where you do have to monitor it. And there are certain things that we each, in, you know, if we have this condition that we can do to help put ourselves in a, a, a better standing that we can improve our overall health. Are we making sure that we're making good choices with the meals that we have? Um, are we monitoring our glucose levels? Are we seeing our doctors sufficiently? So we're looking at overall different things that are important that have been researched on how to manage chronic diseases and take care of your overall self. So this is something that you can be empowered to do in your home. Um, and again, it's through the community setting and it's over the course of six weeks. So individuals can sign up for this there's also the health promotion and disease prevention program. Again, we're promoting education, ideas, importance of living healthy lifestyles. Um, and this, it, it is a great, great program um, for senior citizens. It's a part of overall some of the area agency sponsored programs, but these two are wonderful programs that can definitely help people when you're trying to manage the physical, the mental, and everything that comes in between. Next slide. Okay, so the, the meat of my presentation, Medicare. You can go to the next slide. Um, so within the Department of Family Services Office on Aging, we have a state health insurance assistance program, also known as SHIP. Um, this is an initiative that can be found across the country. Every state has a local SHIP office. Most counties have a local SHIP office. So what is SHIP and what do we do? What do we offer? Uh, well, SHIP it provides free unbiased Medicare counseling to the community. Our role is to help individuals understand their benefits, problem solve. Um, within SHIP, it's technically two additional programs, uh, the Senior Medicare Patrol, which looks at Medicare fraud prevention and scams, because believe me, they are out there. Um, <laughs> the IRS is not going to call you and tell you that they're coming for you. Um, so it's really, really important. There are scams that can come for people for a variety of different things. Medicare is no exception. Um, so one of the things that we do within SHIP and the Senior Medicare Patrol is help educate individuals in the community what kind of scams are out there, what kind of things can you do to safeguard yourself 
to prevent Medicare fraud, a waste and abuse. Um, one example that uh, I learned about was a nun who had been billed, uh, Medicare had been billed for a nursing home stay for two years. This nun did not live in the nursing home. It was a medical billing error, but Medicare had paid thousands of dollars for the wrong person, um, which <laughs> could end up becoming a very serious issue. It ultimately came down to just a simple human error. Um, when the person was submitting the claim, they used a drop down window. The nun's name was directly above or below the actual person that was in the nursing home. Um, but making sure that you're being aware, monitoring your summary notices, um, keeping a journal of all your various doctor's appointments, because if you're anything like me, if I don't write it down, I'm probably not going to remember it next week, three weeks from now, um, to make sure when you get this statement, well, did I visit Dr. Williams last week? Is this bill correct? Is it something that I actually received? Um, so that way we can collectively work together to keep our overall Medicare costs down. Um, and then there's also MIPA, uh, which is the third program under the State Health Insurance Assistance Program, which screens for low income subsidy programs for individuals. Uh, one of the things I often encourage people to do and counsel people on is never suffer in silence. You don't know what you don't know. Um, so don't think that just because this is confusing or you're not really sure what to do, seek help, ask a question. I'm just confused. I'm lost. I can't afford this. Um, is there anything out there? That's part of what SHIP does is to look and problem solve. Are there resources? Is it a matter of making simple changes to the pharmacy that you go to? Um, are you aware that there are preferred pharmacies? versus standard pharmacies. The preferred pharmacies, you can get lower pricing for some of your prescriptions. Maybe have you looked into mail order or have you confirmed that all of your medications are even covered under your plan? So these are some of the questions that we can ask and problem solving that we do when we counsel individuals about their Medicare benefits because it is confusing. It's a little less confusing than me because I do it every day. Um, so unless you're actually working for Medicare, it's probably just going to continue to be confusing. Don't worry, you don't need a, a PhD to understand Medicare. That's what SHIP is here for at the local level. We understand the various programs um, and we can talk to you about the resources that are readily available in your community. This isn't a general um, nation broadcast commercial or anything. These are local resources, local programs. They're specific to this community. Next slide. So Medicare coverage, um, there are actually two options when it comes to how your Medicare benefits are structured. And this is something that can change. It is not something that is uh, written in stone. So you can start off with Medicare, original Medicare and change your mind the very next year to a Medicare Advantage plan and vice versa. So with Medicare, you do have that option to make changes to your coverage at least once a year. Um, and this is very, very important because at some point, the, the model that you initially started off with may not be affordable. You may be that person that's struggling to try and maintain it. Um, you've retired, your income has adjusted. Um, maybe you've unfortunately lost a spouse. So now your overall household income has decreased. So you, just to be aware that there are alternative options to Medicare. So under original Medicare, you have your hospital benefits, which is known as Part A, and your medical benefits, which is known as Part B. So when you're seeing the commercials on Medicare, Medicare Part A, Part B, that is what original Medicare is. It is specifically hospital coverage and outpatient medical coverage. So if you're admitted to the hospital or you have to go to urgent care or the ER, or if you're seeing your primary care doctor, your endocrinologist, your neurologist, whomever, your, your primary doctors, outpatient, that's all original Medicare is. From that point, 
you add on your other benefits. Um, and also with original Medicare, it is 80% coverage. So it's not 100%. Medicare is going to pay 80%. So it's important to know that when you're getting Medicare, you're just getting hospital and medical. A lot of people aren't aware that there are still additional steps that you have to take after you enroll into Medicare such as adding on prescription drug coverage. It's not gonna come automatically. So the prescription benefit is Medicare Part D for drug. Um, that's gonna take care of your medications. Uh, you can also add on to original Medicare what's known as supplemental insurance or a Medigap. They mean the exact same thing. People use both words interchangeably. The Medigaps are separate policies that fill in the gap of Medicare. They fill in that 20% gap. So if you're concerned about how am I going to pay these additional out-of-pocket costs, uh, I, I don't, you know, don't want to be stuck with a lot of medical bills, and I have original Medicare, maybe that's something to consider, having that supplemental coverage, that gap filler, that Medigap, um, to help take care of that. If you are fortunate enough to come into Medicare and already carry insurance, uh, maybe you worked for uh, the federal government, county government, state, and you're able to carry over insurance benefits after you've retired, that will act as your supplement to Medicare. So sometimes all people have to do when they're signing up for Medicare is just get part A and part B because they have all the other benefits that they need from their former employer. The alternative to this is what's known as a Medicare Advantage plan. And I know if you've seen TV all of five minutes, you've probably seen commercials for Medicare Advantage plans. Personally, they drive me crazy. Uh, <laughs> only the primarily the wording. Um, so what is a Medicare Advantage plan? It is a, an alternative to original Medicare. These plans are sold by private companies. Um, some companies you've definitely heard of, some companies not so much, but these companies have contracted with Medicare and their role is to not be a supplement or a secondary insurance to Medicare, but be a complete alternative. So instead of using Medicare, you would exclusively use your Advantage plan for all of your services. So everything that you're entitled to under Medicare the Advantage plans are required to provide those same benefits. So you don't lose anything by going with an Advantage plan that you would get through Medicare. So they also offer your hospital coverage, your medical coverage. Most Advantage plans include prescription drug coverage. So it is not an add-on. And it also can include additional benefits such as dental, vision and hearing coverage, which unfortunately original Medicare does not cover. So I'd like to say the Advantage plan, there are advantages to the Advantage plan, such as getting some added benefits and it's known as part C, like combination. Everything in a combination platter, if you're thinking food is already there. Your combo platter comes with everything right there. Original Medicare is more a la carte. You're picking and choosing the different features of your meal. So those are the two variations for how your Medicare coverage can be structured. And um, it's not on this slide, but a side note, unless you have been collecting your social security retirement or railroad retirement, uh, railroad retirement board benefits four months prior to turning 65, you will not automatically be enrolled into Medicare. You will actively have to pursue your own enrollment into Medicare. And as the age to receive your full Social Security benefits continues to go up, most people are no longer going to be automatically enrolled into Medicare. So it's really important you're paying attention. If you're approaching 65, talk to SHIP. Talk to your HR office, talk to somebody, um, because you're, you're not going to automatically get your Medicare card in the mail. And Medicare does penalize individuals 
for not picking up coverage and benefits when they initially could have. And these penalties are not one and done. These are lifetime penalties. So each month, the penalty gets added along with your other costs. So it's really important to pay attention um, so that you're picking up your benefits at the appropriate time and making sure that you're getting adequate coverage for yourself. Next slide. Um, so the Medigap policies versus the Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, again, this is just another way to clarify the difference between the two, um, because oftentimes people think that this is the same thing. Again, the Medigaps are filling in that gap for original Medicare. They are sold by private companies and the Maryland Insurance Administration is a great resource to identify the various companies that do offer Medigaps throughout the state. They also publish twice a year in January and in July, an elect electronic handbook of all of the different companies that offer Medigaps, which ones they offer, and it actually gives you um, premium pricing. So if you wanted to kind of get a general idea of what some of these expenses could look like, that's a great starting point. Um, but with the Medigaps, state oversight, um, but they do also have to follow some federal regulations and laws. The Medigap works with original Medicare. And again, it covers the gaps of original Medicare. So the deductibles, the co-insurance. Yes, Medicare does have a monthly premium cost, but there are still additional costs. We're getting 80% coverage. So there are going to be additional costs. Um, one of the requirements to be eligible to purchase a Medigap is that you must have Medicare Part A and Part B. So the hospital portion and the medical, the outpatient medical. Um, so if you only have one, you're not eligible for a Medigap. Um, you do pay the, the policy premium for your Medigap policy in addition to your Medicare Part B premium. Um, Cause that's the one when Congress decides they're gonna increase the amount for Medicare, that's the premium that they're referring to, the medical premium. Uh, Medicare Advantages, again, are also sold by private companies. They have federal oversight and they must be approved by Medicare. So Medicare plays a very, very strong hand when it comes to the Advantage plans um, because Medicare could decide we're terminating your contract and that Advantage plan is done. Um, so they do have to follow the rules um, and abide by Medicare standards if you're selling an Advantage plan. And again, it's the alternative to original Medicare and it covers all of your services, your hospital, your medical, as well as offers additional benefits. Just like the Medigap, you must have Medicare Part A and Part B in order to enroll. And just like the Medigap, you pay a separate premium for your Advantage plan policy and the Medicare Part B premium. So you'd be paying two premiums for your Advantage plan because um, the Advantage plan is all inclusive. With the original Medicare, you'd have that premium, your Medigap. Then if you add it on from there, those additional premiums. Next slide. Um, one of the important things, and glad that we're doing this in the midst of this, uh, open enrollment season. Um, so when I mentioned before that you are able to make changes to your Medicare coverage, open enrollment season is typically the go-to time for folks uh, to pick up and make changes to their benefits. It lasts a total of seven weeks. It began October 15th, and it goes straight through to December 7th. It is this time every single year. Um, and this is when you can enroll, you can disenroll, you can switch coverage. Um, you can pick up prescription drug coverage. So let's say you weren't taking medications initially and you said, well, I don't need a drug plan. Why do I want to get one? During the open enrollment period, this is a time when you can pick up prescription drug coverage. And all of the changes that people are making during open enrollment season take effect January 1st. So you're not going to lose anything that you currently have. Your coverage will still continue to be active. 
all changes take effect at the beginning of the brand new year. Next slide. Um, a little bit, uh, again, a confusing, uh, confusing part of Medicare is Medicare compared to Medicaid. I don't know why the words are so similar and so close. It's confusing enough on its own. Um, but with Medicare, that is a national program that's recognized across the country. Medicare goes coast to coast. It is administered by the federal government. One in four people in this country are covered under Medicare. Uh, it's typically insurance for older adults, so individuals that are at least 65 years of age. You are also eligible to get Medicare if you have certain disabilities. After two years, as a matter of fact, of receiving disability benefits, you automatically get Medicare. You're also eligible for Medicare if you have certain conditions like end-stage renal disease, a Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. So there are different reasons and qualifications, but primarily most people are aging into Medicare. They're turning 65. And Medicare is the national primary payer for inpatient hospital services for disabled, elderly, and persons with end-stage renal disease. Medicaid, on the other hand, is statewide, and it will vary from state to state. So this is why when uh, we talk with people and provide options counseling and they wanna transfer mom or dad or aunt or uncle from another state to the, where they live, it's important to know each state manages their own Medicaid system. So Medicaid is not transferable. So it's really important to know the state guidelines for qualifying for Medicaid benefits from one place to another. They are not all the same. Even within our location, Maryland, DC, and Virginia, there are three different income limits to qualify for Medicaid. You can literally move across the bridge and qualify for something or not qualify for something. So it's really important if an individual has Medicaid benefits, you're paying attention and asking those questions, what are the income limits to qualify? How do I get this? Um, Medicaid also has some joint and federal state programming. Um, so some of the programs Ms. McBroom talked about as far as the federal home in-home care services, the CFC, the Community First Choice and the Community Personal Assistance Service, that is one of the federal programs, um, state, state federal program benefits that fall under Medicaid. Medicaid pays for this. So Medicaid pays for your long-term home care services through programs like Community First Choice, Home Community-Based Options Waiver. Um, it's really more of a long-term benefit. So it can cover things that Medicare may not cover or may partially cover, like nursing home care personal care services and community-based services. So when I was saying before, there's different types of healthcare, acute versus chronic. Medicare is more acute, short-term, skilled. Medicaid, more chronic, long-term services. So that is partially why it's really important to know which one you have. If you're in need of long-term services and you wanna utilize your insurance, Medicaid would be the insurance to help with that. If you just need that quick rehab stay, something short-term acute, Medicare's got you. Medicaid does as well, but primarily for the long-term, that's when it's really important to know the difference between what benefit you have. Uh, next slide. Okay, and I'll pause for questions. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Shalise. We've had two incredible presentations this evening. I think, Letitia, um, I don't know if you have any questions. I've seen uh, some, some come through the chat room. Do you have some things? Yes, ma'am. I, 
I wanted to make sure that everybody saw that phone number at the end, but I'll put it back up after we do the questions. Thank you. Oh, actually, Ms. McGroom put her phone number in the chat. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Uh, how does someone find a senior nutrition location? They can contact our office. Uh, we can get them connected with the senior nutrition program. There are different nutrition sites throughout the county um, that offer congregate meals. Some can be in senior centers. Some can be in um, some senior apartment buildings. So we can help direct you to the closest one to your area. And I also believe that a list of the senior nutrition sites is in the senior resource guide yes it sh yeah. should be on the lower yeah. part of one of those actually it's right on the back page okay <laughs> yay okay they moved it yeah so those are some of them there are more i believe because i think it's an abbreviated list yeah those are the ones that have the nutrition programs for the most part mm -hmm. And anybody who may have overlooked it in the email that was sent out, what Mrs. McBroom and Ms. Thomas are referencing are two links. They, they have the hard copies of what was sent to you um, in the email. We will resend those, but it's almost like an ebook. You can just press on the arrow and it'll flip the page. Um, and Ms. McBroom said earlier, if someone actually needs a hard copy, you can reach out to her and get a hard copy. I would um, love to get a couple of hard copies for our office, uh, Ms. McBroom, so that we can have them uh, during the session and for community meetings and events. So we'll follow up with you. those because I did look at the ebook, but it, I said I could print it, but it looked like it was like 50 something pages. I was like, <laughs> am I? Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, is there an application process for self management programs or does a person just sign up? The person can contact our office and sign up for the self-management chronic disease programs. Um, they do rotate when they're offered um, and then they have classes set up. I, I think it's operating a little bit differently because of COVID, um, but pre-COVID, uh, they, they would have different locations where they would offer and you could register in advance for it, yes. Um, can you say more about penalties if not signing up for Medicare as soon as you are eligible? Absolutely. Um, so because Medicare is kind of broken up into different parts, your hospital, your medical, and your prescription primarily, those are going to be the three portions of Medicare. If you are going to be penalized, it's going to be for one of those three benefits. Most cases, people do not get impacted by a penalty for your hospitalization, um, if you've worked at least 10 years and paid into FICA, you've earned Medicare Part A for free. So most people don't pay a premium for that. So a penalty of zero is still zero. What you're going to fill the penalty with is the medical and the prescription. Um, Medicare rules and regulations say for every 12 months that you could have had the medical, the Part B, it's a 10% penalty of the current premium. So if you wait five years, you're going to pay the premium itself plus an additional 50% penalty on top of that. It's gonna be applied every single month for the entire time you have Medicare. So it's really, really, really important that you get it when you're initially eligible um, it's also important that you get it when you're initially eligible. And when I say that, I mean, at least when you're first turning 65, assuming you're aging into Medicare, turning 65, you want to start that process. You get seven months to sign up for Medicare, which starts three months before the month you turn 65, the month you turn 65, and three months after you've turned 65. Everyone gets an initial enrollment that's seven full months. You can sign up for Medicare during this period of time. No penalties are at play. Outside of your initial enrollment window, there are very, very few special enrollment periods that would actually protect you from a penalty. One of those exceptions is if you are covered under an active employer group health plan. You are punching in on somebody's clock Monday through Friday. It can be you or it can be your spouse, but you're under that person's policy through the job. When they retire, 
you would qualify for a special enrollment that lasts eight months where you could pick up Medicare without any penalties. Pretty much outside of those two things, there are very, very few exceptions. So don't bank on the special enrollment when you're at least 65, assuming you've retired, um, you can go ahead and start that process to sign up for Medicare. With the prescription, that's also a portion where you could be penalized. So even if you don't take medications, get a prescription drug plan. The penalty for prescription drug plans is 1% for every month you did not have a prescription drug plan and they base it at least off the median amount across all prescription drug plans. So this year coming, I think the average for premiums for prescription drug plans is $33.10. So let's say I don't take anything, but I, I want to get it so I can stop my penalty. And I sign up for a plan that's $7.10. My penalty isn't going to be based off the $7.10 premium. It's going to be based off of the median amount, the $33.10. So it's really important, even if you don't take medications, just get the cheapest plan. There are, like I said, there are plans that are $7. You can get the lowest cost drug plans. It covers everything that you don't take, um, but you don't have to worry about being penalized for a length amount, lengthy amount of time. And this also goes back to ask questions. There are programs that are out here that help to pay for your Medicare. These commercials that you see that talk about giving you $148, that's a Medicare savings program. So there are programs out there that can help you afford Medicare. I had a woman in her 90s that paid $300 a month for her medications. I talked to her, found out she was eligible for a subsidy program called Extra Help. Her co-payments went from $300 a month to $30 a month. She had been eligible for that level of assistance the whole time she had Medicare. So almost 30 years of overpaying for something she could have gotten help for from the beginning. She didn't know, she never asked. Wow. Ms. Sharma has a question. Uh, yes, uh, this is, thank you so much. This is so much informative and I have Medicare Advantage. Does that mean that I automatically have uh, coverage for Part A, B, dental vision and prescription or do I have to sign up for that on an individual basis? I was totally confused with this Medicare Advantage program. Most of the Advantage plans that are gonna be offered, um, it's gonna be an an included benefit unless that plan has identified specifically, like for example, with Kaiser Permanente, they offer a dental vision and hearing bundle, but it's a $25 add-on. Um, with Care First Blue Cross and Blue Shield, they offer a basic dental vision and hearing benefit, but one of their plans actually allows you to enhance it for $17 more. Um, so it's not so much the dental that you'd have to add on, if anything, I would just confirm with your provider, dental vision and hearing benefits are a part of the premium that I'm paying for this plan, or is there an additional fee? Thank you. I think I need to go to a class on this. This is really- We host classes <laughs> because I, on I, Medicare. Benefit, but I have no idea. <laughs> this has <laughs> the, the first Tuesday of each month from yep. 10 to 12, um, we have a Medicare uh, training class. Um, but this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Ms. McBroom, Ms. Thomas. You have done a fantastic job with Let's Talk About Long-Term Care Resources. Next month's Let's Talk is going to be on December 2nd. Hey, we're going to talk about avoiding cyber scams. Many of us are getting emails where people are telling us the IRS is chasing us or they have a new warranty for us or click here or you're going to lose your credit card or all these things. So we're going to have some experts come and provide useful tips to protect us from online scams, protect us from identity theft, 
and to protect our, our systems from viruses. I tell you, there are, these scammers are getting more and more sophisticated with each and every month. So especially while they know all of us are very dependent on our, our computers and technology. So we're looking forward to and hope you all will join us on December 2nd on this channel. We'll be in touch very soon. Thank you all. Be safe and have a great evening.